are listening to Conversations with Shonda, a podcast and event series hosted by Shonda Smith Baker. Our guest today is Sharon Sales Belton. She was the first woman and first African American to be elected mayor in Minneapolis from 1994 to 2001. She shares with us her wisdom and experience. Enjoy the show. I've been um, surprised that philanthropy hasn't been more involved in criminal justice reform and like violence prevention work. Yeah. And those were two things that were really important to me as I entered into the work. So we started out on bail reform and we were going to just stay there. And then we were touching on some of the other things around probation um, and the policies there, realizing kind of the entire ecosystem that's around the justice system. But with Floyd and Brianna Taylor and other things, it just feels like I'm compelled to figure out, is there a bigger, broader role that you think that we think that the Minneapolis Foundation should be playing? You know, one of the things that I would just say is that um, in years back, uh, particularly the last time Minneapolis had a big crime spree, which was, you know, back in 1995, the truth of the matter is that the Minneapolis uh, Foundation was very actively involved. Uh, in uh, the development of the, uh, or the implementation of the plan that uh, was uh, developed. They're also sitting at the table, you know, helping to inform, you know, the plan, but, but they were integral to um, our ability to uh, be successful in reducing the crime rate and doing it in a way that was uh, informed. And we weren't using these terms back then, but data driven. And the Minneapolis Foundation was involved. Uh, the McKnight Foundation was involved. And what they did was that they actually, you know, partnered with, you know, grassroots on the ground community organizations that um, had um, relationship with the community. Because what we learned from that, you know, from the analysis of all of what was behind all that crime um, was that we were failing as a community to connect with the, the youth on the street. We, we were failing. We were sitting in our little ivory towers in our community organizations waiting for kids to come in, you know, and ask for, you know, whatever it was they needed. And what happened was the Minneapolis Foundation and others said, we want to fund the community organizations to get outside of their buildings and, and move amongst uh, you know, the community. I mean, it was almost like they were re they were funding again, the street workers. Yeah. And guess what? You know what people are talking about today? We need more people on the street, on you know the what? street. This is, a, yeah. this is nothing. I don't want to say nothing is new under the sun, but I do want you to know that, um, that the foundation absolutely played a role uh, in shoring up and strengthening and fortifying the organizations, the youth development organizations that were already out there. Pillsbury United was right in the middle of my neighborhood, you know, when I was a council member. And one of the things that um, this funding allowed us to do is that we put a whole directory together of just the programs that were available in South Minneapolis, in the eighth ward. And guess what we did with them? We put those, that information in every household. So when parents were saying, I don't know what, what my kid could do. I don't know where he could go. I don't know what she can do. I don't even know what's out there because they're too busy living life and just trying to, you know, keep it together. So we put the resource in their hand. I mean, there are things that we can do. Um, and it's and it doesn't have to be rocket science and it doesn't have to take forever, you know, to sort it all out. So as you were talking, I was thinking about Tony Wagner. Yes. <laughs> And, um, you know, Tony used to always say to me, like, I came into the work where people trusted youth workers, right? Like, yes. like the, we were paid to go out, walk the avenues, you know, talk to young people and say, why aren't you in school? Right. Are you engaged in sports? Why are you hanging out on this corner? Right. And our job was to connect with them and to get them connected to things. Yes. You know, the work has evolved to be, you know, you need to be enrolled in a program. You have to come in. We have to work with you on your math and your literacy and all these things. And those are well, you know, worth it efforts. I get yes. that. But he used to always say that we're over-professionalizing what used to be relational work. Yes. 
And do you think that philanthropy or do you think we've gone too far in terms of those expectations that we don't trust that the street worker will have the impact that it's needed on the front end? So therefore, we're not willing to support it. You know, I think there's a couple of things that I think it's a great question. But one of the things that uh, even happened, uh, you know, back then is that um, did, did people, again, support and believe that the street workers had their credentials, uh, I'm use that word, credentials uh, to effectively do this work. And one of the things that we discussed back then was, you know, it isn't the credentials, it's the relationship. This is, it's the, it's, it's the relationship and the relate people with the relationships are the ones that can get young people to come in the door. And then if they come in the door and, and it's some technical support that they need, um, you know, to address whatever their underlying issues are, then you can have professional people, you know, you know, doing that work, but the professional people are not the ones that are bringing them in the door because they don't have that relationship. Right now, of course, the, the flip side of that was, well, we also want to uh, develop our own community members so that they are the professionals uh, also that uh, the young people encounter because they're more likely to listen to and adopt, you know, the behavioral changes or the ideas, et cetera, that a professional that they can relate to shares with them. So there, there's, there was work to do on multiple levels, but what we first had to do was we had to help, you know, the funding community understand that they needed to invest in the people who actually have relationships with the people who you're trying to communicate with. Because if you don't make that connection, nothing else you do is going to make any sense. It's just not going to work. And, uh, and I think back then, because people were really, they were concerned about the, uh, the crime rate, um, there, were, there was fear and there was anxiety around it. And so they were willing to you know, try something new, try something different because whatever they were doing before wasn't working anymore. Yeah. So now we have a very similar situation. Absolutely. You're talking about 1995, I would even say late eighties, right? To, to 95, like there was just a surge of violence. And then now we have a very similar circumstance that's happening while there are these efforts to defund the police. And so we see not just the, the sort of youth worker going out, but now you see groups emerging to help police, to, to, to mediate, to um, create more peaceful sort of um, streets, right? To create peace. So do you see that as being sort of a different effort? Like I have, I have concerns around the community policing model and I also understand why it has emerged. Well, you know, um, two things that I would say, I think people, you know, um, create new things, uh, new strategies or whatever, when there are voids or gaps in the way that services are provided. And clearly there was a void and a gap or, or, and if it wasn't a void or a gap, it was mistrust. And so when any of those things um, uh, exist, there's just, you know, there's a call for and a cry in some ways for somebody to step in and fill the void or to step in and take corrective action. And so I think the people who are responding, you know, in the community are people who see that void, interpret that void in a particular way and want to step in and, and, and be helpful. I believe very strongly that they want to be helpful. And I believe that there's a way for them to be helpful. My concern is that these activities have got to all be coordinated and they have to be a part of a comprehensive plan. And the thing that concerns me most greatly uh, is that we've got, you know, conversations going on that say defund the police. And I know that's a more complicated, nuanced uh, um, statement than most people you know, take the time to kind of think about. Um, But nevertheless, you you actually do see, you know, a a loss in the level of police presence in our community. And in that, you know, that, you know, reduction in police presence, lots of interesting things happen. I mean, 
criminals or people who are interested in um, in pursuing, you know, disruptive uh, behavior, they know how to take advantage of void, right? And so they're out there. And somebody in our people in our community, you know, think that there needs to be a response to that. And we can't count on the police to do it. Somebody else, you know, um, is going to step up and they have. But the problem, in my opinion, is this is not a coordinated effort. Um, this is not um, Police Chief Arandondo, in my opinion, having oversight over how um, or input into how that's done. That needs to happen. Mm -hmm. That needs to happen so that we can actually have the outcome that the, you know, the citizen patrols are seeking our neighbors are looking for and um, the, the police department wants, or I know our chief Arandano wants. And so how do you bring those conversations together? Yeah. And my concern right now is that um, there's still too much friction. There's still too much, there, there are too many agendas. And how do you bring multiple agendas together so that you can find uh, identify a common path. I think the I think the Minneapolis Foundation can be a part of that, bringing all the people to. I mean, because you you have an interest, but you don't you you know you you don't have control. Do you know what I mean? You have an interest, uh, and, and you have influence. And so, how can we bring the influence of the philanthropic community together to get all of the citizens, all the professionals? on the same page and moving in the same direction. We say we are, but I don't know that I, that's what I'm witnessing. Yeah, do you think the political climate will allow for that? And then it feels like we're in a place where there's this orientation. I keep saying cancel culture, right? Like if, if we disagree with each other, I'm gonna stay over here and, we're, and I'm gonna stay over here, which is you know one of the reasons why we wanted to do the podcast even is to say, how do we bring sort of divergent thinking into it? How do we learn as a foundation? How do we bring guests on that we may or may not agree with everything that they say? But let's let's bring out a point of view. And so, do you think that in this political climate, we could actually get to agreement? You know what? I'm I am forever the optimist. Also, I'll just say that right off the bat. So you know, so my my nature, my spirit says. Uh, yes, I don't think that that's going to be an easy conversation because I think um, too much of the political um, discourse right now is seems to be uh, targeted at um, um, really dismantling uh, the police department, and uh, which, in my opinion, makes no sense whatsoever. We need to have a police department, but having a police department doesn't mean that the police department is the only thing that we have helping us to address issues of public safety because so much of public safety, to be perfectly honest with you, is more about prevention and intervention than policing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, if you really stop and think about it for a moment, if we do a better job understanding what contributes to crime, then we can prevent it. If we witness um, behaviors or actions that contribute to the growth of crime, the spread of crime, we can intervene. The people who do the prevention and the intervention don't necessarily have to be the police. And particularly, I mean, there's a role for them to play. I mean, a case in point is the Police Athletic League. This is, I love the Police Athletic League. I love it. I, I love, love it. it. Okay. This is important for young people to interact with the police in a positive way so that the narrative about, you know, who the police are and the role they play in their community can be dispelled. My, my kids went through the police um, activities league. Yes. I sat on the board. My stepson went through it and now he's a police officer. Right. Okay. Like, I mean, I love the Pell program. It yes. has subsequently through all of this, it got cut. I know that. And I was furious about it. And I thought I wrote letters. I, you know, did send communications out to lots of people. 
I mean, it, that was that was a that was a bad decision. That was a bad decision. That decision needs to be overturned through some you know process. I don't know whether or not the current city council is going to do that because I think they're more bent on um, dismantling, and I'm not not defunding. They may be for that too, but dismantling uh, the police department. And um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be very honest with you. I was very active in the conversations about um, defunding and dismantling the police. And the reason I believe that is because I absolutely believe that you have to have a public safety professional team. That team is the Minneapolis police. We can have lots of other people cooperating, collaborating, and leading other prevention and intervention strategies in our community. And we should have them. You know, I, you know, I don't know if you know this about me, you probably do. Um, but, you know, in another life, you know, I was a parole officer. I was a probation and a parole officer. My responsibility was to make sure I understood where all the resources were in the community so that I could help people who were trying to get their lives back on track so that they could be contributing citizens of our society. I believe that from the bottom of my heart that that is good work to do and we all need to be engaged in doing it. I also believe that the community, the philanthropic community, the public community, and by that I mean the government community, we all need to be working together to ensure that that infrastructure for you know, people getting their lives back on track, avoiding crime and violence, et cetera, are in place. We have let that system fray. We have let that system fray. And guess what happens when we do that? When the problems creep up and manifest themselves on the city streets, who's the person left standing to go respond to that? The police. They're not, that's not the right team. Yeah, that's not the way. And this is nothing. This has nothing to do with how they perform their job. That's a whole nother question. But they are not the right team to respond to every single problem and issue that we have in in our community. I would I haven't spoken to any of my former colleagues who are in probation and parole in a long time. But I I think I would doubt seriously whether or not the community has the resources today um, that we had, you know, yesterday, and they were probably inadequate yesterday. But yeah. I'm gonna, what I'm going to say is that I don't believe that we've strengthened these uh, tools and these resources, and we have to do that. Yeah, we also. I mean, I've watched after school programming and youth work also be um, uh, diminished in terms of its funding. Yes. Right. So to me, that is the major prevention is getting kids connected to caring adults and to their community, um, teaching them, working with them, showing them experiences actually that live outside of the, the, the worldview that they have, I think, is one that I really missed in the evolution of how I saw youth work move. Oh, um, when I was at Pelzer United, I'm like, it really went from it being like this fun environment where you're teaching them all kinds of stuff and watching their little personalities develop to one that became a little bit more of an extension of a school day, which was not as enjoyable for anyone. Absolutely. But you know what? I'm glad that you just mentioned that because, you know, every time I think about um, um, the days when we were um, trying to rebuild the community infrastructure so for our, the youth in our city. Uh, I remember a project that was so dear to me. Um, it was actually at Pillsbury on 35th in Chicago, and it was an arts program. And one of the things that they did is they brought in, um, you know, the artists in our community, and uh, the artists in our community sat down with the kids in our neighborhood who had an interest in art or their parents wanted them to have an interest in art. And they would work with these kids, you know, on Saturdays and, you know, and, and then they, they did projects and they, I mean, it was wonderful. We actually had, they did an art show one time and then they just, you know, showed us all these wonderful things that they were learning in their art class. And a lot of kids kind of really found themselves, you know, in that experience. And in, in, if you could just see, you know, the, 
the smiles, the happiness, the um, the energy that you know these kids you know kind of express. You just knew that there was something there that you could build on, and that they could you know evolve in, into the you know the person that they dream themselves you know to be. Well, it, I was I was, was one wonderful. of those kids. I was I was definitely one of those kids. They used Were to. Have, <laughs> I was. They had a ceramic class there that my mom signed me up for. And so I still have my little, I, I still say it's a turtle. It, I don't know what it actually is, but, um, you know, and, and I remember my mom when I, when I was at Pillsbury and became the CEO and there was something that came out that said I was a kid that was, you know, I was a client of the, of, of Pillsbury United Communities. And my mom just had a fit. She said, we paid for you to go to that art class. Yes. Like, like you were a neighborhood child going to a neighborhood program. Yes. You're not a client of anyone, right? Yes. You are a member. <laughs> you were a youth member of this community <laughs> that, that, like, you know, like she had a real sort of um, commitment to not diminishing me through language that was often yes. put upon our community. Um, but I absolutely went to that summer program there and then the one over at Oak Park. And I can name so many people that are leading in community now you know, Makeda Zulu Gillespie and I Absolutely. were there, you know, Mahmoud Al-Khati was coming and teaching us class on heritage. And, um, you know, my roots are deep because of those experiences. And I'm, I'm concerned that we don't have the same sort of um, appreciation for that now. But you know what, but we can. And the, the thing, you know, the thing that we were talking about earlier was how do we come together to um, kind of realize the community that we want. And it really requires everybody to count, you know, to, you know, kind of sit at the table and whatever, not, you know, representing them, themselves and their own individual view, but really stepping back for a second and, and, and raising the question, what do we need in our community? What resources do we currently have? You know, you know, where, where are the gaps? How do we fill those gaps? Do we actually really need to create a whole bunch of new things? Maybe not. Maybe we need to rethink some of the ways that we're doing the things, you know, that organizations are already doing. I, I'm just saying, I don't, I don't, I'm not a person that believes that um, we need to reinvent another wheel. We've got some wheels. How yeah. do we put some tires on them so that they can actually move? Right. So how does, how does a probation officer become mayor? <laughs> <laughs> what was that like? Oh, I don't know. You know, I think the thing that really, the truth about all of that is that um, um, the job, um, the volunteer work that I was, you know, doing, um, those things put me more in touch with the the needs of my community and, um, and the disparities that um, our, our community uh, experienced. And once you have an opportunity to kind of look in inside that and understand it as a system, it's pretty hard to um, not want to do something about it. It's pretty hard not to do that. And so um, I think, to be honest with you, I, I really didn't have a, a, a plan, a strategy to, you know, to be an elected official. You know, to be perfectly honest with you, if you would have asked me when I was a PO, what did I, what did what did I aspire to do? I would have told you that I aspired to be the warden of Stillwater Prison, mm. and largely because I had a strong philosophy about rehabilitation that I really thought uh, could um, be beneficial to uh, the correction system, and that um, and as a believer in redemption and rehabilitation, I felt like. You know, there would be so many things that I could do. And plus, I'll be very honest with you, um, back then, um, all of my male colleagues told me that will never happen, Sharon, because you're a woman. And so, of course, that made me want to do it even more, right? Because um, if you got good ideas, it shouldn't matter if you are a woman. It shouldn't matter if I'm African-American, none of those things should matter. If you've got ideas and you got merit and capability or whatever, you ought to be able to take your dreams wherever they allow you to go. But the, the, but setting that aside for a moment, I think the, the path 
the things that I did that led to um, me getting into uh, elective office had everything to do uh, with my passion around trying to find solutions to the problems that we faced in our community. I mean, all the work we did around sexual assault, domestic violence, most of that work was just as a volunteer, but what it did was it put me in touch with the needs of women and African-American women all across of this, um, uh, this community, all across the state. And um, I, needed to, I needed an outlet to do something about it. And I'm, I love being an activist. I loved being um, an advocate, um, but I also learned uh, that advocates and activists uh, can play a role in shaping public policy. And uh, I believe that um, I could make change from within. And so um, I need my activist friends on the outside, you know, pushing, prodding, pushing. I need that, uh, but we also need people on the inside who are receptive to change. And I, I was willing to, um, to go on the inside and be, um, a you know, a, a reciprocal of the ideas and the, and the energy of the community and then to advocate for, for public policy change. I don't regret uh, making any of, uh, of those decisions. I think there were a lot of wonderful things that we were able to do together as a community. I don't think it was perfect. I don't think, you know, we boiled the ocean or did any of those kinds of things. But I do think that we helped put Minneapolis on a path uh, to do some things better uh, uh, for, for all people in our, in our community. We have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. I don't think it starts with, um, I don't think it starts with dismantling the police. I think it starts with us taking a, a, a look and exploring, you know, what is at the core, you know, of, of, of uh, the problems that we're having with the police? What is at the core of the disparities that we're experiencing in our community, disproportionately affecting African-Americans? What is at the core? And spend more time examining how we address those issues how we prevent them, how we intervene. That's what I think we need to do. And um, I'm older and, and, and um, wiser and mature in my thinking around these things, at least I think so. Um, and, uh, and I'm a little bit more impatient than I was years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that, you know, people like yourself, you know, will, demand, you know, that we, you know, all come to the table and we set aside, as my grandma would say, the okie doke. Yeah. <laughs> and have a real conversation about the real change that we're looking for in our community. Yeah. I'm tired. I'm I'm tired. I'm tired. And you know, and I also, you know, I think about um you as our, our first African American male. And I can't help but think about that for our chief of police. And um, I know that that brings a different sort of challenge and opportunity. Um, I believe in our chief's leadership. Um, I also am incredibly concerned that he's getting cut off from the resources that he needs to really be effective. Um, what are your thoughts about what you think our police chief needs in this moment? Well, one of the things that I'll say is that he needs the continued support of the of the public. So everyone who who believes uh, that we shouldn't dismantle the police department, everybody who believes that there's more good than bad, those people need to to step up. Now, you'll you'll know that over the uh, summer we put um, uh, ads uh, in the Star Tribune. We put ads in every neighborhood newspaper across the entire city saying we need to support our police chief. We need to have a real conversation about police reform. There's no doubt about that. We need to find ways of um, getting rid of um, re uh, terminating the employment of law enforcement officers who violate the public trust. 
We need to do that, but we need a police force and we need this chief. This chief has the right values and the right ideas, and we ought not be undermining him around some rhetoric um, that, um, that I understand con- is contributing to a conversation, but have that conversation and we don't need to eliminate the chief or disrupt or undermine the police chief to have that conversation. Yeah. So I, that, in my opinion, needs to stop. And again, it's one of the reasons why we put that ad out there. But the people who, who are the we, like when you say we put the ad, who is the we? So, uh, so here's how it started. It first started uh, with a letter uh, from me, uh, Walter Mondale, and um, Bob Brunix um, uh, from the University of Minnesota. So he wrote a letter to the uh, editor, and then we had some people sign on to that that uh, letter, and uh, and then more people heard about it and read about it, and they wanted to sign on. And it just kind of mushroomed across the entire city. And then people said, we got to get that message out. And then so people said, well, how do we get the message out? And then somebody else said, well, let's put some ads in some newspapers. And we had an agency um, provide uh, uh, their uh, public relations service to us on a discounted basis. And and we raised enough money to put ads in every newspaper a community newspaper across the city for a couple of purposes. Number one, to raise the awareness, to let people know that there's another conversation out here. There's another narrative out here. And in this narrative, we support the police chief. We want reform, but we support the police chief. We don't believe that you undermine the police chief in order to get the reform. Those two things can happen simultaneously. Let's have the conversation. So we just wanted to add some normalcy uh, to you know the um, to the the, the conflict uh, that was going you know on in the community, and so now we're hoping that um, some of these sessions that um, organizations like the Minneapolis Foundation are have set up, the task force that the mayor has set up, that all of these things will lead to something. Can I just tell you one of the concerns that I have? is that if you've got a whole bunch of different disparate activities going on, it is highly possible that it will be really hard for us to come together um, uh, in the, in going forward. So I'm gonna just say that um, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm not involved in any of these groups, but I'm just hoping that there's communication going on uh, between the, or, the groups that believe they're all kind of on the same page or at least like-minded because in order for for us to be able to um, balance the the counter narrative, we have to be united. We have to be united. And my concern is that there's, that we're not. Those of us who all want to support the chief, those of us who want a rational conversation, um, those of us who are demanding reforms uh, with the police, we're, we're, we're not as coordinated as we need to be to balance the narrative that says, let's get rid of them. Mm-hmm. We need, we, you know, we're the people. So this is what I'm just going to say this out loud. We are the people. And if we don't believe that the city council is articulating a message or a series of policies that reflect what we want to do as the people, then we need to let them know that. It's hard to do in a COVID environment but we have to find ways of being able to do that more effectively. You know, we did those ads this summer. I mean, in my opinion, those ads should be in the paper every day. We need to be in people's faces every day saying, let's, you know, have accountable police. Let's have appropriate resource. uh, And uh, let's, you know, focus our time and attention on, you know, the underlying issues. If that's racism, Go after it. Yeah. You know, if that's um, unemployment, go after it. If yeah. it is um, um, a broken education system, tackle it. But if you think that you can dismantle the police and all this stuff is going to go away, you're out of your mind. 
because the racism that you see in the police department is a manifestation of the racism that exists in our community. They are one small segment of it. And it's not even the whole group. So again, uh, you know those stories we used to hear where people said, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater? Stop it. Yeah, yeah, I hear you on that. And I feel, you know, so we have um, council members of a different generation. And that generation has grown up watching Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, yes. Tamir Rice, Philando, George Floyd, right? They're growing up in social media and getting connected yes. to these fatal encounters, yes. right? That are, are are so like synonymous now with their with their being. And you know, I have kids in that age range, right, in their 20s, um, that are like, enough is really enough. Like, like I don't have time for reform. I don't have time for the meetings and the, and the connection and, and, and the mapping. Like, we're, we're tired of it. It hasn't worked. Why should we trust that? Let's basically, let's blow, blow that up and, I, and let's, <laughs> let's start over. Like, it, you know, it doesn't feel maybe irrational from their point of view, it seems a little bit impossible from how we know change happens. But what would you say to those that are just completely freaking fed up? Well, uh, just so you know, I, like you, have um, uh, young people of that age and they are fed up. And so when I have conversations with them, like the one you and I are having right now, you know, they're rolling their eyes at me and they're saying, mom, we're we're tired of it. You know, Nothing's going to change unless we just, you know, you know, blow it up, you know. And so that's what they say to me. And 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 I mean, these are the same children who who watched all of these um, incidents unfold across the country and would talk to me about each and every one of them. Um, in the Philando Castile case, that, I mean, that was the yeah, that was one of the cases where they these my sons were most. Um, were extremely upset because, you know, they just really didn't understand how you can follow the law, do everything you're supposed to do and still get shot and dead. Okay. And they were, they were really freaked out by it. And I, and I understood that. Here's what I say to them. I understand your anger and and your, your frustration. And I think that there is an urgency that we need to, um, um, that we need to act on. I absolutely believe that there's an urgency and it isn't that we don't know what to do. I think that there has to be political courage to do those things that we should responsibly do. And I know there are people who don't think that the Minnesota legislature did enough uh, this summer around some of these issues. But what I'm going to tell you is that I'm actually proud of the fact that the state of Minnesota has said no chokehold, no hog ties no warrior training, you know, we're going to have a database in our state where there are, these are not all the reforms that are needed, but these are steps in the right direction. And I'm saying that because I'm watching at the national level, nothing happened. And I've heard people at the national level say, you know, don't wait on Washington to make change. You guys need to make change at the state level. And so that you can get action now, maybe the nation will catch up with you but you should do some things right now. We need to do that. And so I'm actually in, I'm actually affirming the fact that we have at least on the books actions and steps and laws now that now have to be enforced. Will they be enforced? Well, the proof's in the pudding. Yeah. And the, uh, you know Yeah. How big how much of an issue is the federation contract? You know what? Here's the thing about the federation uh, contract. I mean, the the terms and conditions of employment are absolutely something that the city has to be paying attention to. And my understanding is that they're going to be negotiating, you know, the contract uh, sh- shortly. But one of the things that I want to say about the, the contract that um, that doesn't just relate to Minneapolis, but just relates to the entire law enforcement um structure in, in, in the state of Minnesota. They have some collective bargaining rights. 
And I understand that every all employees have collective bargaining rights if you're a public employee. But here's the thing that I really believe about the police, uh, the police, the police have a lot of, um, you know, authority uh, in uh, in discharging their duty and they have the opportunity uh, and the right um, shouldn't say opportunity. They have the, you know, the right to use um, lethal force. And so if you've got the right to use, you know, lethal force in the discharge of your duty, which is supposed to be protecting the public safety, then I have the responsibility or the right, you know, as the employer to hold you accountable for the decisions that you make associated with discharging that duty. And I don't think that there's enough teeth you know, in the system that holds officers accountable for excess violations of, of those policies and rules. And I think that's one of the uh, areas where I think we really need to do more work. Now, something did happen in the legislature this year and you, you're aware of it. And I think other people are too, maybe not enough people. They have decided that rather than just, you know, allow police departments or federation police unions to be able to uh, identify any arbitrator that they want, go shopping for arbitrators or whatever, that they're gonna create a, a police arbitration panel. So theoretic, so now you have to pick between amongst these six people and uh, you don't, you know, they're assigned and so you can't go shopping for arbitrators. Well, I think that's gonna be interesting, but I'm gonna tell you something that I'm still concerned about. At the end of the day, the arbitrator is not um, responsible to the public. And I think what we want and what we should be looking for is people who have oversight over deciding whether or not um, the level of force that was used was appropriate or necessary, et cetera, should be somebody who is accountable to the public. And, um, and I think that's, I think we should continue to talk about that. I think we should continue to advocate for that. And just um, a couple of days ago, um, I moderated a panel uh, on this very topic where we were trying to get, get the police chiefs, the legal community, and, the, and people who are in the arbitration business to have a legitimate conversation about what's right in this regard. What is, what's right? Um, how, did, how does the public you know, hold um, an arbitrator accountable. We can hold the chief accountable, but the chief makes a decision to terminate. That gets sent to an arbitrator and the arbitrator says, I don't agree with the chief's decision. I wanna give the police officer another chance and nobody knows who that arbitrator is and nobody can hold him accountable, him or her accountable. I think that's wrong. And I think that's one of the areas where I continue to have frustration and police chiefs, and police executives also have con some concerns about them because I can point to several chiefs in the state of Minnesota who have fired officers for excessive use of force um, and or um, uh, sanctioned them for excessive use of force and their cases were overturned. Yeah. And so when, when the community is focused on the mayor and the chief, are those the places that, in fact, we should be focusing our efforts? Well, I do believe that there's some uh, some focus on our chief that we should have. I mean, we have to have good policies and procedures in place and, and, and so that we're holding our officers accountable. We have to have, you know, performance management tools in place to hold people accountable so that we can build, you know, a record. We have to have um, processes in place to correct, you know, behavior that's inappropriate. So we have to have all those things because I'll tell you, arbitrators will say, oh, the, the cities, um, you know, didn't um, uh, equally or consistently apply uh, the, the discipline. And because of that, um, we're going to let this guy off or this person off or whatever. Then they'll, they'll find all kinds of, I'm not going to call them excuses, but they'll find reasons to rationalize the decision that they made to reinstate an officer. So I'm just going to say, honestly, I do believe that we have to have our own house in order, but I also believe that we have a, a design in our system uh, that is not um, fair to the taxpayers. And it is definitely not fair to the police chiefs, because I'll tell you something, 
we can hold our police chief accountable. So if we, you know, if we had a police force where, again, people were getting away with stuff over and over and over again, because we don't have any insight into the arbitration system, who are we going to blame? We're going to blame the police chief and we're going to blame the mayor and we're going to blame the city council. And so that's not the right, that's that, that, that blame is, 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 is not, it, it may be appropriate in some ways, but it doesn't tell you the whole picture. Yeah, it's broader than those. those it's three. broader than, but people don't have any awareness of, of that. And, and I think the thing that we've got to do, and I've said this over and over and over again, you got to tell people the whole picture. They don't, they can't have a simplistic view of, um, or an uninformed view of how these things are all interrelated. So tell the truth about the role of the arbitrator. Police chiefs tell, you demonstrate to the public that you have all the right systems in place and that your hands have been tied and we'll support you. Yeah. We'll support you. We, this is the change that we really need to make. And I'm, I believe that if necessary, we need to show up over at the state Capitol. A lot of people are very disappointed that a lot of the conversations that took place last summer um, were behind closed doors and there wasn't a lot of opportunity for the public to weigh in as much as they wanted to. That shouldn't happen because it, it's the public that is concerned about their safety and welfare. Are you talking the about the, are you talking about the working group? Yes. So I was, I was on that working group and, um, and I, I hear that we went around this, the, the, the state. state, Yes. Um, we took in a lot of information uh, locally and nationally. Um, you know, I think that there was a powerful day that was equally as frustrating as it was powerful when community protested that work. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I do think that there is a place to broaden and think about what does true community input look like. Um, in a in a process that's more expanded than that one, and I also feel a great deal of um, I don't know satisfaction may be overstated, but that I feel like there were recommendations, those twenty eight recommendations that allow for faster movement in the legislature um, that where some of those policies were passed. So I'm I'm sitting between both. And that as a community member, I feel like, you know, I've weighed in and have felt frustrated, right? Like, yes. yes. Um, and I think that there's other areas that um, could be improved and expanded upon. So I, I hear I hear that. But here's the thing that I'm going to say about it. I mean, I, and, I, and again, I hope I didn't sound too critical. No. But the thing that I just think is that we, we have to take some action, right? And is it going to be perfect? No. But does that mean that you, we stop? Does that mean that we... Uh, um, uh, go back to our conversation about uh, defunding and, and dismantling because we weren't happy with what, you know, an outcome was. No, you go back to the drawing board and you take the work to the next level. This is where I think there's a lot of frustration on the part of people who are, again, tired and want change immediately. And they believe that, no, we want change immediately. And so city council, we want you to uh, slash the budget of uh, the uh, police department and cripple them to the point that they can't even provide their services. And that's troubling to me. It, you know, and, and here's one of the things that troubles me that um, mm -hmm. I just want to put this on the, in, in this conversation. Okay. So people will use, um, oh, the police shouldn't be the ones responding to uh, people who are having um, uh, mental health problems. Uh, the, the police shouldn't be the ones uh, responding to people who are uh, homeless and um, vagrant or uh, chemically dependent and aggressive. And there needs to be other people responding to that. I, I think that that's true. I think that that's true. But I want to know where's the conversation? Who's leading the conversation about who, who's building that team? Yeah. Um, because if and, you don't the cost of it, the infrastructure yes. is, is inadequate. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Where is that conversation? I mean, I honestly wish that the city council was leading that conversation as opposed to focusing all their time on, you know, how do we slash the budget or something like that. Um, I, I actually called my friends over at the county and said, you know, uh, the county, county, where you know, most of these resources and this 
expertise is in your wheelhouse. Um, where, how do you want to show up in this conversation? I know it's not an easy conversation. Nobody has the resources. But to be honest with you, if you're really trying to solve this problem, focus on solving the problem, what the solutions are to the problem, and then focus on, okay, now how are we going to pay for it? Yeah, but I don't, agree don't jump. To, don't go. Let's not talk about it because I don't want to pay for it. I- yeah, yeah. Before we go, um, you know, in this moment, post George Floyd, yes, we've seen a lot of people moving to action, and um, I think this the comment that you made around what I what I am going to summarize in this is a complex inner inner interrelated issue. That you cannot simplify. You have to take time to really understand the complexity and lean into that complexity. Basically, find your find your lane within that, but understand right with with the context that you're trying to move in. And so we have um, many people, not just corporate leaders, but a lot of people in the community that are like, something has to be done. I move. I want to act. How do you? um, What do you think is the business? opportunity here for for our corporate leaders oh um i think they're multiple in fact there's a conversation going on the today uh, or this morning uh, around uh, what's what's the response i think you go should go back to what you initially said in kind of teeing up that question there are multiple lanes that we need to act in in order for us to um find this solution solutions that were um that we need uh, and so I, I take a different cut at this a little bit. So my view is that um, I want to go and if I'm passionate about, let's say, youth development, I want to be in a conversation where the lane I'm playing in is focusing and targeting on the youth. And and why do I think that's important? Because for every reason that we just discussed with regard to uh, crime and violence. So I want to I want to uh, divert uh, young people from a life of crime and violence. I want to divert um, uh, young people from a life of poverty and despair. So I want to I want to that's the lane that I want to play in. Now, somebody sitting next to me, if, it were, if my son was in this conversation, he would say, "Mother, I'm 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 for addressing educational disparities because I believe if we ensure that our children are getting a quality education, then they won't uh, be um, uh, distracted uh, by, um, you know, the ills, um, you know, of the, com- of the community, because we can get them on a track. And if we get them on a track, they will excel and they'll do well, et cetera. So he would like to uh, swim in that lane and focus all of his energy on addressing where the gaps are in our system around education. So what I'm, what I'm arguing for here is um, a conversation that allows for us to be able to um, make a contribution in the space where we're most dedicated. Um, if I'm, I'm, a, I'm a police reformer, so I want to be in the police reform conversation. I don't want to hear about any of the other stuff because I've got other working groups, you know, working on all of these other elements. I want to raise their focus on on um, the police reform so that I can understand what's needed. I can direct myself over to the state if that's where um, my answers lie or wherever they lie. But I I just think that we shouldn't have an expectation that that we all going to get together and we all try to boil the ocean together. I just think that that's a recipe for disaster. The other thing that I want to just throw out there just quickly, because I actually believe uh, this with all my heart, is that I think that um, there's a role for um, uh, the arts community to play uh, in the, this discussion also. One of the things that I've learned is that um, people don't know how to talk to each other. People don't really understand um, everyone's you know, circumstance or, you know, or, or, their, or their life or in the elements of their life. One of the things that I know about art is art can tell you a story about what's really going on in your community in a non-threatening way that is very informative and transformational. And I will say that uh, I have just absolutely been inspired by 
a lot of the new artwork that has emerged in the wake of the killing of Jeff um, George Floyd that really help people to understand when they didn't have insight when they had none, you know, into how, you know, communities see the world and uh, how they feel connected uh, uh, to the world or to the community. And I think that that is absolutely powerful. And I think more of that needs to happen. So just like we said earlier that, um, you know, we've disinvested uh, in, um, in youth, um, we've, some people have come to believe that the arts is something, you know, fun and on the sideline and let's do it if we can. I think art has the power to change people's lives and their perspectives. Just think about what happened when so many people were able to pick up their phone and see a video, a piece of art, a yeah. video of George Floyd's murder. And I think the fact that so many people could see it so many people could understand it. So many people could feel the pain and the anguish of that moment is what really turned that tragedy uh, into a global movement, a global movement where everybody is demanding that something change in their own country, in their own community, for their own people. Um, and um, and and I'm just I'm in, inspired by that. And this is not a moment. Um, this is not a time that we can, you know, afford to squander. Yeah. I don't know if I could even say it, say it better. And when I look at those images and I think that we need to make sure that we're preserving and sharing those stories and connecting and tying and encouraging. Um, I know that you're an optimist and you just gave this very eloquent, inspiring way to kind of close us out. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess my last question is, and I think I know the answer to this, is that do you think this is a moment in which we will break through to new ways and new understanding around the depth of the um, structural challenges that we have? Do you think that people will be able to act in new ways um, that will help address some of the disparities that we've been living with for far too long? You know, my first answer is uh, is yes. But the, the caveat that I would uh, offer uh, is that uh, all of those uh, people who um, uh, were a witness uh, to this and who are not actively engaged uh, in uh, the transformation and the change need to get off the sidelines. This is not a, a time for us to um, just kind of sit back and um, um, praise other people who are rolling up their sleeves and working on this. This is a time for everybody uh, to find a, a way uh, for them to contribute uh, to the change. And so, you know, we were talking about it earlier. What are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? And whatever that is, get involved in that vehicle and push for, you know, the change. If it's housing, I mean, there's no... You know, there's a, a long list of uh, things that need to be addressed uh, that have contributed to people feeling alienated and not belonging and and not protected and respected, you know, uh, you know, in our in our community, in our society, in our nation. And so, hey, um, there's something for everybody out there and, and everybody's got to be involved. If you just relegate it to a small group of people then you'll get a response that reflects the interest of a small group of people. So if you want it to be inclusive. Get in the game. Get in the game. Yeah. Awesome. Get in the game. Okay. <laughs> I, I loved spending this time with you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. I feel like I just need more of it. So one day off video, I would love to talk more about, um, just where you think we can help. I am, I am fighting all the powers that be and um, the foundation is absolutely willing to get in it. I'm, I, I just need probably some support navigating that a little bit internally that I could use some advice on. Whatever you need, just um, um, I'll feel free to reach out to you and you feel free to do the same. Thank you. Thank all right, you. you're in my prayers always. All right, back at you. Have a rest of the, the rest of the day. You too. 
That's Sharon Sales Belton and Shonda Smith Baker. You can follow Shonda on Twitter at Shonda S. Baker. This is Sue Potkinitz from the Minneapolis Foundation. Thank you for listening to Conversations with Shonda.